good to kind of go back to a little bit to kind of set the framework, remind ourselves what we were really charged with doing, um, both as a reminder to states that have been involved with this and also just to give a little bit of an overview for those that are attending with us today. Um, as you know, we were charged with actually putting together a community of practice, not to actually directly support families right away, but to really look at the infrastructure across the country and look what's happening inside states and say, you know, what practices, what policies are out there, what can we do better? And I think what we're starting to see now as we fast forward to year four is, is now that we've got that framework and we sort of have figured out what it is that we're trying to do, you're really starting to see concrete things happening. And that's what we're going to really, really be digging in this, this afternoon and today. As you know, uh, these are our project outcomes. To develop a national consensus um, around a framework for having conversations about supporting families. And I will tell you, um, I think we've done more than that. I think we've created this sort of energy and movement across the country that's about the, the individual person with a disability as well as the family movement, you know, and really sort of united that and sparked that. And so I think we've created a new language out there. When I go to a state and I, I listen to people say the word trajectory or they say the word life course, and, you know, I think we put new language in our field. When I hear a person flip from saying family support to now they say supporting families, I know they've heard this framework. I know that they're trying to make this more than just a program. You know, when we first started out, that's what we were really challenging ourselves. The wing spread um, document was really a challenge to our field to set, that said, families need to be supported, and not just in your little family support programs you keep funding, but we have to really, really take back the onion of, and unpeel it under every single layer of our systems and of other systems and say, how are you supporting families in a really good way? You know, and that's evident here today. We've got schools here today. We've got, we're talking about employment. So we're not just talking about the bubble of family support anymore. We're really talking about how does every system and structure support families. And I think that's huge. The other part is, is um, you know, it's creating that national framework, but then really looking at that, what does that look like inside our states? And I think you got a little preview of that last night, but you're really gonna get that today. Um, you know, you're doing the hard work. You're the one in your state saying, I've got this framework. How do I implement this? And how does it touch everything I do on a day-to-day -day basis? And then the last part is we were challenged by the feds to really, how can we replicate and, ex and, and, and expand these practices? And I think, first of all, that's evident in the 11 states that said, we want to be a part of this conversation. We want to be a part of that. And there's other states and organizations that are contacting us all the time, um, both wanting to know more about the framework, but really wanting to know about the practices that you guys are doing. So this community of practice is designed to be, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of get your arms wrapped around. It's hard to kind of evaluate, because it's really, really creating a framework for you guys to think differently back inside your organization. So we like to always talk about setting the stage, and, and you know, many of you know that you have access to all these slides. These slides are for you to be able to message this back and spread the word. Um, and I always like to use this slide to do this. And it's kind of funny because when we look back on some of the stuff that we have created in our year one, they were really just ways for us to articulate things, but they've really become sort of the foundation of all the work that we did, we, that we're doing. And we had this slide a long time ago, and ironically, we had no idea that that integrated star was actually going to become a major principle of this framework. Um, so it looks like we planned it, but we didn't. Um, and Yoshi's know she's teasing me all the time about, like, you had this plan all along, didn't you? Uh, so we always talk about the fact that we know people exist among their family and their community, and that's what we're striving to do. But we also know the reality that sometimes disability brings other needs that, that need to be supported. And so as a field, we've spent lots of time figuring out how do we support that person? And we've really wrapped our services around that individual. You know, sometimes we did it. We moved into institutions. We moved into special ed classes. You know, we've done all these sorts of things. And now fast forward in 2000. Internally inside that yellow circle, we're challenging ourselves and saying, is that really the best way to provide services? 
And what are we unintentionally doing when we wrap that person around the services system that we've built? And if you even look at that service, the circles itself, it is cutting people off from their families, their friends, and their communities. So as annoying as some of those new rules up here, they're exactly what we're asking for. We're asking for people to be supported in the community. We are asking for people to provide services that are about the person. So the language and the framework that we're using is right in line with where we're wanting to head anyway. And so what we've said is, is how do we, we know that people need supports, but how can we do it differently? Because we also know that this is not all people with disabilities, because we know only 25% of them are actually getting state services. But we kind of talk in our field like that's 100%. You have a disability, you get services, and we're just trying to fix those services. We know that that's not the reality, too. So I think the other thing that our, our um, community of practice has done has really brought light to the fact that we're, we're not focusing on the all. And that we continue, continue to only respond to those that are pounding down our front doors saying, I need help. And that requires us to think very differently. We have to think about how do we prevent those crises, not just respond to those crises. And that framework is really helping us do that. So to me, this is the vision. To me, this is a vision that hopefully CMS and other organizations are using. This is not a disability vision. This is how do we take the person with where they want to be, with where they want to live, um, the people they know, and support them. But we also have to change the way we support them. We have to figure out other strategies besides always looking for the formal service system to have the answer, to really create a supported, good life. And so to me, this circle is a visual of exactly where we want really the whole U.S. and all social services to go. But we, we also had Hans Mesner come in here a couple years ago. And there's a couple things from his book that I think are really important. And he talks about the fact that transitional change isn't going to get us where we need to go. That our field really needs to go through transformational change. And if you really understand what those words mean, transitional change are just sort of fixing things as the way they are, right? You know, you create a new process or you change the name of your case managers to service coordinators or support coordinators or however many names if you want to name them, right? But until you really change their function, to really you change their, their values and their conversations, you're not going to make any real change. And so what, what, what Hans is calling for, and what I think that our supporting families um, community of practice is calling for, is we have to transform at the value base. We have to transform our assumptions and our beliefs. And so in order to do that, we have to create new language. And that's what this framework is helping you do. It's giving you the language to move from just tooling and fixing little things inside your system to saying, we've got to look at this from a different angle. We have to ask the questions very differently. So what is the guiding principles for the life force framework? First of all, all of you helped develop these. You know, in our first year, we spent that first year having meetings and having discussions what our principles are. And that was happening at the exact same time that the family and family in Missouri was working with stakeholders every quarter to really develop um, the charting the life course materials and, and Jane shared with you the life experience book. All that stuff kind of converged together. And so we have some very um, essential guiding principles. The first and foremost is, is this has got to be driven by self-advocates and families. It has to be. But this isn't just this project being driven here. You're trying to take this framework and apply it across the way the systems, across the way organizations do their work. So the heart and soul of everything we do, we have to stop and say, are the self-advocates and families driving the work that we're doing? Now that doesn't always mean sitting in the room, although they need to be sitting in the room. But that can mean, did you ask them questions? Do you really know what they really need? Or are you sitting around assuming what they need? Because I think that's why we, why we are where we are in our system. We think we know what families need. And so we keep building all this stuff. And they don't want it. But if we would just stop and ask them to begin with, we'd build it the right way to begin with. The other part is that what's essential is, is we're not just focusing on developmental disabilities. 
we're focusing on how are we really helping. If we want people to be included in school and recreation and employment, we have to be a part of those systems themselves. We can sit around in our disability conferences all we want and talk about inclusion. It's not going to happen until we truly integrate across all the other systems. So um, Yoshi's going to show, uh, share with you um, some examples later of how, how you guys have partnered beyond the disability partners. You know, you've brought some really unique partners to the table. And the more that we can spread it across disability and non-disability specific sort of entities, and the more we can cross across the lifespan, the better we're going to be. You know, it's really cool, um, and I remember the first time we did it in Missouri, we wondered if it was going to happen, and now you guys are doing it across the country. It's really challenging yourself that every time you have a meeting, do you represent every, every strand of the lifespan? <coughs> Do you represent different types of entities at the table? Because that's where the real change is going to come from. They've got good ideas. We need to listen to them. The other thing is, is like, I, I think, I, I do remember, we had early childhood and aging, and I'm only showing them because they're the extreme. We have the others in between. And people are like, what would they have in common to talk about in the room? I actually think that's what the federal government, when they, when they created the Administration for Community Living, I think that's what they had in mind. What they had in mind is that we have common issues we need to work across. And the more we silo those to specific life stages, we're never going to get anywhere. So if, if aging wants to focus on aging in place, that doesn't start happening when you get old. Aging in place starts when you're younger, right? So we have to have aging in place conversations way down here to set that value. If we want employment to be an outcome, we don't start at 14 at the IEP meeting, right? So we've got to figure out how we cross our life domains across our life stages. So that challenges us to partner very, very differently. At the heart and soul is our core belief. And I don't know if you have it memorized, many people have it memorized, but it's just the fact that we all want to live, love, work, and play like everybody else. That's our core belief. And a couple years ago, we dropped all people with disabilities. Because why do we add with disabilities on there? Every time we add with disabilities, that means we just created a different core belief for people with disabilities than the concept of all. That sort of implies that people with disabilities aren't a part of the all. So we drop that. And so all of the work that we do has to apply universally. This isn't a disability issue. This is a human rights issue. And how are we really supporting that? And that's our core belief there. This comes straight out of the wing spread, right out of the wing spread definition. And I think what was beautiful about the wing spread event was that it was an attempt to unite both the self-advocacy and the family movement, to unite the self-advocacy goals and the family goals. For a long time, they've been sort of hitting heads, which I actually think is a natural sort of phase in sort of a almost like a teenager trying to get their independence from their parents, right? You kind of, kind of hit heads with them, but you're still a strong family unit. So I think what, what this, what to me, what this, what this represents is how do we help individual family members, all family members, mom, dad, siblings, the person with the disability, all achieve self-determination, not just the person with the disability, but all their members. But at the same time, how are we helping that family holistically have the supports they need as a family unit? And really unite this, but not really divide it. You know, how can we really um, <clears throat> connect those two together? You guys are probably tired of hearing me talk about this, but the all is the heart and soul of our conversations. Really, really bring it to light. When I'm sitting down and I'm talking to legislators or state policymakers, and they're focusing on a wait list, and they're saying, gosh, I'm so excited. I got 100 people off that wait list. I'm sitting there saying to myself, they have no idea. <laughs> right? I don't think we're presenting the full picture to people. And it's doing a couple different things. It's creating the soft or false perception in families that everybody gets services but them, because that's how they feel. The other thing it's doing is when you're making policy decisions or structural decisions, you're only making it for the 25%. And I understand you have tight budgets. I understand there's a lot of pressure and all those other things. But if you're only just ignoring all those other people, what's going to happen when they show up at your door? 
So it requires you to behave very, very differently. Your budget may only be able to impact these people, but how you talk at the front door, how you partner with early childhood, how you partner with aging or develop an ADRC outside of your system is all going to help you serve that 100%. But that requires you to change your behavior. If you're only fixing what you're touching, you're only going to touch 25% of the people that need help. And you're not always going to touch them really well. So it requires us to think very differently. But we have to educate more people. You know, wouldn't it be really great if actually people started to recognize this and the government figured out funding to support people differently? And if they did that, are we just going to keep dumping it into the old way that we behave? Wouldn't it be really nice to think about a different way to start supporting more people? Public health have had to do this over the years. You know, public health doesn't just serve the people in the hospitals, right? So we've got to start thinking and using that concept very differently. I have no idea why I have Ohio in here, but you're in here. Uh, as you know, if you don't have your own triangle, the triangle is a really great reminder. I love to have this triangle at any meeting, a DD council meeting, sitting around with the county board at our county level. You can make this, this triangle for any level. And if you're having strategic thinking meetings, where's your triangle at every single meeting? Because what you're going to find yourself quickly doing is only talking about people over here. And you're going to start talking about your rules for monitoring people over here. And you're going to spend all of your energy and all of your hours look in this direction, and your back is turned in that direction. So the, to me, the triangle has become a reminder, we've got to look across this whole triangle. If I am if in charge of a budget, how can I try to put some of my, my budget or some of my staff time focusing over here while I'm also serving over here, doing what I'm, I'm charged to do? Because technically you're charged to do all of it. And so, so how can you really look at your own numbers and kind of watch your own numbers? The other thing, obviously, this is about providing person-centered supports within the context of family. Right there is really where you see a lot of your work come together. And really getting our fields, those folks inside our field and those outside of our field, to realize families have lifelong impacts on their members. You know, but for some reason in our field, family is a dirty word. Right? It's like a dirty, oh, that family. <laughs> there they go. They're not ever happy. Right? But are you satisfied when something's going wrong with your family? Do you just sit and let it happen? So why would families have a child with a disability sit and let it happen? And so, you know, really thinking about this big push from CNS to be person-centered, it says the word person in there. But person-centered means you have to pay attention to their family. Being person-centered actually implies paying attention to their characteristics, paying attention to their social environment around their family, paying attention to their dreams and aspirations and culture of that family, paying attention to, to the people that they know. That's what person-centered really means. You know what, our, what we think person-centered means? A really great set of tools. That's not person-centered. This slide right here is the most person-centered content in this entire presentation, probably. Really understanding both the person's experiences and the family's experiences. Understanding the, the family dynamic. If I go into a person's home and 49-year-old person with Down syndrome is living with 89-year-old parents, they might be a very codependent unit. And you have to be considering that when you're thinking about how you want to serve them now and how you want to serve them in the future. Again, people in our field have said to me, and maybe just because I keep saying this, they've stopped saying it to me, but I serve people and I don't serve their families. That statement we have to erase from our field. You serve a person that exists among a family, whether that person talks to that family or not. Maybe they don't talk to that family because that family actually caused harm to that child or that adult. They're still impacted by their family, good and bad. And how are we responding as a field? But what we also know, you know, you look at aging. Aging doesn't go, oh, I'm sorry, this is about the aging person. Spouse, leave the room. Our children, leave the room. We don't care what you have to think. That's what we do in our field. 
weird. That is really weird. <laughs> if someone brings um, somebody to support them at a doctor's office and they don't have a disability, no one would question them being in that room. You bring an adult with a disability to a room, they'll say, oh, I'm sorry, are you the guardian? Where's your legal paperwork? <laughs> Why do we do this to people with disabilities? It's so strange. So what this whole entire project is about is to make that stop happening. I can't evaluate that very well. It's not a training. It's not a, plan, a good planning meeting. But what it is is saying, wow, it's natural to have family here. And it's OK. And it's natural to actually talk to a self-advocate that says, I don't want my family here. And then you get them out of the room. That's also what this, field, this conversation is about. Is how are you balancing that and supporting that? This is not about putting the family's needs first, but really balancing the context of, the, of both the person's and the family's needs. The other thing that we're really trying to do is we're not looking at service outcomes. We're not looking at service outcomes. We're looking at life outcomes. And your services should be saying to themselves, how am I supporting life outcomes? How does the services I provide lead to what that person wants to do? That's what we should be evaluating. But instead, we evaluate how our services are. We shouldn't be going in and saying, how good is this provider? How good is this service coordinator? What we should be coming in and saying, how well does your service coordinator help you get the outcome that you want in your life? That's what we should be evaluating. That requires us to change that conversation. But what we also know is we've introduced this concept of trajectory. You know, and I know, I know that that word trajectory might be hard to say, might be hard to understand, but you know what? Still introduce it. Because how do you expand and change the framework and change the language and change the values if you don't go, oh, it's too hard for them to understand? So utilize the words of the framework and help people understand them. Because it's words that create the next movement. If you think about person-centered language 20 years ago, people don't know what important to, important for are. Everyone in their field knows what it is now. So really help people think about this concept of trajectory. But the reason why, whether you use that word or that concept behind that word, the idea is we have only focus on what's happening now. This is what people in our field say. They are, there's just too much going on in their life. There's no way I'm going to talk to them about what's happening in 10 years. Well, you know what? That 10 years is here tomorrow. And now all of a sudden, they have a 25-year-old, and you haven't forewarned them of what they should have been working on. You cannot go back and replace those 10 years. You can't do it. So you actually have a professional responsibility to deal with the here and now with a little bit of an eye on the future. So as many of you know, we run a family to family resource center and I'm constantly telling my staff is how can you actually help somebody, even on a five minute phone call, if you don't know where their finish line is? How can you give people information? How can you connect them to a resource if you don't really know if that resource is gonna help them get to where they wanna go? We know from both research and our experience in talking to families is they don't know the questions to ask. And the things that they do ask are often words that we put in their mouth that they don't really know what they, what they are or why they're asking for them. I mean, I've been to many of your states recently and I, I use the same, the same story. Of, like, when you, do you, if you're sick, do you call your insurance company and ask for, you know, number 445 billing code? When a family calls you and asks for a waiver, that's essentially what they're doing. We want families and people with disabilities to call and say, I need employment. Do you have the funding to help me get there? I need behavioral supports. How are we going to make that happen? But instead, we have trained people to call and ask for things they don't even know if they want or need. So how do we get back to focusing on those life outcomes? The trajectory has also become a way for people to really advocate and articulate what they want. I can't tell you how many families say to me, this visual and this conversation helped me say to my school, you know what? That segregated classroom you put my kindergartner in, it's leading me right to what I don't want when they're older. And if we don't start in kindergarten, leading to friendships and community and expectations, 
that we're just going to set his whole life, starting at five, towards what he doesn't want it. So that concept of trajectory is both for us and also to really help people articulate what they want. So, I don't know if all of you have seen this visual. It's not there yet. Um, <laughs> but you've seen many of the circles and visuals, and so this puts it all together. We're talking about the person within the context of their family, we talk about all of their life domains that are interconnected, right? And what we're trying to do here, it's really nice. We're, we're doing this to help both organize information so we can really like hone in and help people understand healthy living, community living. But we also know they're also very, very interconnected underneath there. So how can we focus on these quality of life domains? And how we propose doing that is through what we call our three buckets that came straight out of the wing spread report. We know, obviously, goods and services are really, really important, but we also know that families feel alone and lost. And how can we really help with that? We can help with that by connecting them to parent to parent, to sibling networks, to other people to problem solve. But most importantly, do families have the information they need to make good decisions? Do they have the information that have a dream for their child? That's what we're talking about here. And so how are we really challenging ourselves to make sure at all times those three types of supports are provided? You might be a service provider that only provides goods and services. That doesn't mean you should ignore the other two buckets. Your job should be saying to yourself, do they have the good information to make that decision? You know, our, our, our systems are challenged right now to, um, to this, this one kind of kills me, but to, to know people have made the choice of where they wanted to live. I'm like thinking about my own life. I'm like, can I really choose to live where I'm living right now? Right? Like, life circumstances brought me here. I mean, and I suppose I got to choose that house over that house or whatever. But the choice, the choices came from having good information. Choices came from having the experiences of knowing what you want and didn't want. Choices came from probably talking to lots and lots and lots of people. You think about families, you think about people with disabilities. And now we're saying, did you have choices in your goods and services? Oh, and by the way, did you only talk to us, the one provider in your county? So we really have to be thinking about three buckets all the time. Every interaction as a professional should be, am I considering the three buckets? And even if I don't provide information and peer support, do I know what exists in my county? Do I know what exists in my state? Am I connecting them to those organizations? Am I connecting them online? Do they have that support at their faith-based communities? Where are they getting that? Because I can't ignore the social emotional aspect and that sort of really cognitive understanding of the family and the person with the disability. But what's become really, really central to the community of practice is the star. And the star is just the outside part of the ring, right? And what it is and why it's become so essential is because we have talked in our field about formal services and natural supports. And what our community practices is challenging both ourselves and the nation is, is if you're going to say the phrase natural supports, you better tell me what it is. And you better help me get it. And you better not use it against me when you're looking at my need for supports. Right? And so what we've done is, is we've tried to define it. And if you notice, we don't use the word natural supports. Because, like, I mean, what does natural supports really mean? And doesn't everyone have natural supports? Shouldn't they have natural supports? And so what we've done is when we first started this out in the first year is, is we knew what eligibility specific was. But it used to say disability specific. And if you notice, it says eligibility specific now. Again, another challenge to ourselves is that there are eligibility-based supports in your state that aren't disability. And are you accessing them? Or are you only looking at the sliver of disability supports because you just limited yourself or your family that you're supporting them? So how are you expanding beyond just disability specific to all eligibility specific supports in this part of the star? People think of natural supports in one of two ways. They kind of throw it in the same bucket. Natural supports are like, well, don't you have a mom and dad at home who can take care of you? Or isn't there a neighbor? So it's the people. To me, relationship-based natural supports are the people, the relationships, the people that you know. And I will tell you, 
That doesn't mean it's everybody you know, because maybe that neighbor isn't going to provide you support, but they're a friend to you. That's a good type. Of, that's an emotional side type of support. The other kind of natural support people think of are community-based supports. Sadly, our field thinks of community-based supports of oh, because they're things we don't have to pay for. <laughs> then go get that in their community, can't they? We have to stop thinking about that like that. Like the community is like this, you know, just dump all. Like we're not going to do it. Just go find it in the community. But really instead, thinking about the incredible resources our community <coughs> offers us. And maybe think about that first. And then think about how our paid supports can support that or enhance that or connect that or make that happen. The other two are essential and crucial and so quickly get overlooked in our field. And to us, the reason why this star is so important is that all five of these have to be elevated to the same level when you're problem solving. All five of them. And if they're not all five there, then what we, ha what, what we do is we only think about eligibility first, we think about community, and then we go, huh, there's a waiting list for this, I don't know what you're gonna do. But what we have to get people to think about is, how are you using technology as a day-to-day -day support? And again, for people with disabilities, that's an afterthought. And we think about technology of like, oh, that's cute, they have an automatic communication board. Oh, wow, they're using their iPad to do stuff. Really? What do you guys have in front of you? Earphones. So why doesn't all adults with disabilities have phones? When you look at the United States, you're using your phone for alarm clocks. You're using them to be connected for emotional support. You're using them to check email. You're using them to stay connected to relationships through Facebook. So why don't people with disabilities think about technology as a day-to-day -day support? Again, it's an afterthought. But what's really, really interesting, though, and it really came from you guys, was that we can't forget the individual strengths and assets. When we sit down and problem solve, oftentimes we ignore that part of the star. Transportation, I think, is the most concrete example of that, right? Someone says, hey, Shell, I need transportation. You know, the first thing that we used to think of was, it's like, well, do you have sheriff there? <laughs> oh, you don't, oh, you don't have services. Oh, well, do, can you take a bus? Well, why am I starting with, can you drive? Do you want to learn how to drive? Okay, maybe that's not a possibility. Do you know any friends that work with you that maybe we could figure out a buddy system for driving? Right? Or maybe you can learn how to take the bus and you can use your cell phone that can help you get off at the different stops. But I'd have to teach you that. We have to start with the person's strengths. That's where we should be starting every time we problem solve with people. But we go, we go, our INR services and our paid services, we've gotten to the habit of running straight down here. So the star is an attempt to change those conversations. The star is an attempt for people to know, we're not saying this is bad. At no point in this conversation have you heard me say this is bad. But what you have heard me say is how do we integrate across those? If I do access this, how do I make sure that this isn't my whole life? How am I accessing all of those things? If I can't access those, I better have a way to have a conversation with the family about what they can access and utilize. And that's how we're utilizing that star.